Greetings, happy warriors, and welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, solemnly dedicate myself to revealing for you how the world really works. And one of the essential ways in which the world really works is that uh, life works better when you are partnered with a life partner of the opposite sex. In other words, when a man and a woman make a lifetime commitment to one another and then proceed to walk hand in hand through life together with the children that their love creates and brings into the world. There really is not a better system. And yes, there will always be the exceptional individual for whom this doesn't work. And yes, there will be the occasional marriages in an ideal world where there will be a few divorces. But by and large, by and large, this is a system that works. I will tell you, some of you may know that uh, Susan and I are very enthusiastic boaters. And as a matter of fact, particularly while our children were from birth through, I'll say through adolescence, uh, all our, and you know, we worked really hard uh, we were we worked very very hard, and the only time we we literally only took off Shabbat. We took off every Saturday, and we took off uh, Jewish holidays during the year. But other than that, we worked with the exception of a summer vacation. Summer vacation, uh, our preferred summer vacation, is on a small boat for uh, a few weeks or a month and a half or a month or two. Uh, off the west coast of Canada, off the coast of British Columbia. That's just what has always been very special for our family. Now, the first time we did a major ocean crossing, um, the, the children were very small, and we sailed from California to Hawaii. It took 22 days. It was on our sailboat called Paragon. She was a 44-foot uh, Peterson sailing cutter, and that means it had two sails forward of the mast and one mainsail on the mast. And uh, it took us 22 days to sail from California to Hawaii. And that July that we did that trip, uh, over 200 other boats did the same trip. I'm telling you this to indicate that uh, this is not a terrifying ordeal, provided you know what you're doing, provided your boat is in good shape, provided you uh, choose your time to uh, accommodate the weather. Uh, this is not a, a dangerous activity, uh, even, even though I will admit both my parents and Susan's parents were far from sanguine about us taking their precious grandchildren on a 22-day ocean voyage to cross the Pacific. But um, in any, at any given time, like right now, I would say that there are hundreds, maybe probably not thousands, but many more than tens, certainly hundreds of small boats, shall we say, between the size of 35 foot and um, 70 foot. In that range, there are hundreds and hundreds of boats like that circling the globe, um, some doing it in, in a hurry, in months, others taking years to do it. They are um, almost invariably crewed by a husband and a wife, by a man and a woman. Sometimes they have children along. Sometimes they're an older couple and the, the children are already grown. But uh, yes, any time if you would go down, if it's, um, you know, if it's the right time of the year and you go to a harbor town, wherever you live, uh, to a harbor town that is on the route, as it were, um, you know, most of the Caribbean ports are like that. Um, many harbors in Florida, uh, certainly in the Pacific Northwest, on the west coast of America, Hawaii, 
uh, Australia, uh, South Africa. There are there are standard harbors that everybody stops at, and you will at any any day of the week you will go and you will find, and they're easy to recognize. You can easily tell the boats that uh, are not the ones that just sit in harbor day after day, week after week, year after year, the boats that are actually out on the blue ocean and crossing oceans and doing ocean passages, you can always spot them and recognize them. And you, you'll you find they're almost always happy to talk and tell you what they do and where they're up to. And, and we've indeed had many very pleasant encounters chatting with people who are in the middle of such uh, either circumnavigations or long-term passages. Why do I tell you this? Because... Uh, almost invariably, as I say, they are uh, a husband and wife traveling on the boat together. And uh, almost invariably, they've been married for a while. And almost invariably, they are happily married. And uh, in this community, divorce is virtually unknown. Now, the reason this is a huge surprise, why this is really interesting, I'm going to tell you in a moment, because you might have thought differently. But first of all, I want to recommend that you choose this time to become a formal happy warrior. You go on their website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and go to where you can become a happy warrior. One of the things we've started doing for happy warriors is we've started presenting a regular feature, an eye on Israel, in which Susan and I talk to somebody in Israel who has inside knowledge, somebody who knows something, somebody who is experienced at what life in Israel is really all about, somebody who might know something about uh, the, the war and the struggle. Um, and so that is now available for Happy Warriors, along with uh, a number of other benefits available to Happy Warriors. And all you've got to do is go to the website and look into this. And I look forward to welcoming you to our very special community of Happy Warriors. People, all of us, people who care about our families and our finances. We care about our friendships, our physical fitness, and our faith. And we're eager to share with one another. We're eager to encourage one another. We're eager to help one another at all times. Um, somebody just wrote on the Happy Warrior website, somebody just said uh, he is arriving in Tokyo for a few days and he'd like to meet up with any Happy Warriors in Japan. I'm hoping he did, and I look forward to hearing about that. But... Uh, uh, but that's the thing that uh, I would like to recommend, and I'd like you to also, um, if if you are fairly new to this idea that the five fundamental focuses of your life are your family and your finances, your friendships, your fitness, and your faith, then I'd recommend that you take a look at our book called <clears throat> The Holistic You. The Holistic You. How to integrate your five Fs, your family, your faith, your friendships, your finances, and your fitness. And uh, you will find that that is a wonderful way to reshape the blueprint of your life and to move forward in productive and fresh ways that will really fill you with joy and with delight. So the book is called The Holistic You and uh, Become a Happy Warrior so you're not traveling this path alone and uh, enjoy. Okay, here's why it's a bit of a surprise. Because <clears throat> to people who've never done it, um, time on a small boat seems to be <clears throat> just deliriously enjoyable. You know, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the fact is you are completely off the grid. You are completely self-contained. Um, so there's no such thing as calling the guy to come and fix something because there's nobody out there to fix anything. You're on your own. And um, if the water goes off, you don't call a plumber. You figure out what the problem is because you are responsible for your fresh water supply unless you're boating on the Great Lakes, in which case there's no shortage of fresh water. Um, electricity goes out. 
you got to supply you you generate and produce all your own electricity uh, the um, how if you cook by gas your butane or your propane you know you're responsible for taking care of that whole system and keeping that safe how about sewage waste toiletry toilet work Okay, um, you're so used to pressing the flush lever on a domestic toilet and never giving it another thought. Domestic toilets are so well engineered and so well established that if a domestic toilet gives you a problem once in five years, that's a lot. But on a boat, it's a little bit different because it doesn't just flush it away. It's got to flush it sometimes upwards to where a, uh, uh, the, the, the outlet may be. And it's not only got to flush it, but you'll pardon me, it's got to macerate it, and it's got to uh, turn it into a slurry that, uh, that can work. If you've ever been on an RV, you have at least a little bit of a taste of it, but not the same, because in the final analysis on an RV, it does just drop through the bottom into a tank in the belly of your RV. But on a boat, it's really different. And so there are all these systems that have to be kept operating. Plus, there is the sails and the rigging and all that stuff wears, you know, during the constant nonstop motion of an ocean passage. The stuff wears. You've got to monitor the wear and you've got to replace it before it fails at a bad time. And navigation, there's a lot to do, a whole lot to do all the time. And things go wrong. You know, you you spend uh, cooking on a boat, right? It's hard. The boat's moving all the time. It's leaning over. The stove is set in gimbals, in a, a kind of uh, bearing that allows it to sway and swivel as the boat sways and swivels. And uh, and so you you know you might spend an hour and a half you know, preparing a, a, a wonderful meal with cutting all the ingredients and marinating and cook. And then at the last minute, as you're about ready to serve it, the boat gives a heave. And because you, you know, you, you weren't holding on, you know, using both hands, whatever it was, all of a sudden, the result of a whole lot of work lands on the cabin floor and it's a mess and it's got to be cleaned up. And now the dinner you're looking forward to is not happening. And, you know, People, especially the ladies, end up crying every now and then on a boat. And uh, and on YouTube, there are a number of channels of couples who uh, record on video their adventures on a boat and make it available for people to watch. And uh, and so if you know if you happen to be interested, you can easily see it. But uh, but you know you'll sometimes see. Usually the girl, you know, will, it often happens. She just gets very weepy because it's it's just frustrating. And I mean, just even basic things like, you know, personal hygiene, showering, it's hard on a small boat, but you know, you get used to it and you do it. And most people who, who boat feel it's worth it. The, the benefits outweigh the costs, but you could have been, you could well imagine that with all this level of potential frustration and challenge and just the sheer physical difficulty, you know, you move around in your house and if you're on a single level home, you really have no problems at all. But on a boat, everything is an up and a down and a climb and, and holding on as the boat moves. And you, know, you really could well imagine that on a boat, aggravations would fester and finally, after a few months of this or a year of this, the couple, you know, the wife would say, it's either me or the boat, you know, and uh, and that would be the, the end of the marriage or the end of or, or the end of the adventure. But the funny thing is that I know this world quite well, and I will tell you that it's almost unheard of to hear of uh, of a couple that divorces on you know who live this lifestyle and i thought that that would be an interesting thing to touch on and I'll, i will tell you some of the characteristics almost without exception the couple devolves automatically to what i call blue jobs and pink jobs almost invariably it is the woman who does the cooking who keeps the boat clean and the man who 
operates the sails and pulls up the anchor and and looks after the maintenance and fixes the toilet when it breaks and keeps the engine running and keeps the electricity on almost invariably that's how it breaks down now at the uh, at the termination of a passage uh, you're going to either dock the boat in a harbor or in a marina or you are going to grab a mooring ball which is a big float with some rope attached to it and the the big ball is attached by a chain to a block of concrete resting on the floor of the harbor or the bay and you tie your boat to that or finally you drop your anchor you lower your anchor and and make it get a grab hold of the bottom the mud on the bottom and then that'll hold you in position and uh, what you often find is that in the beginning, couples will arrange it so as the guy is bringing the boat into the harbor and the girl jumps onto the dock with a rope and ties it up, or the guy is maneuvering the boat at an anchorage and the girl is lowering the anchor. And I will tell you that it took Susan and me no time at all after we got married to realize how dumb that was, because the easy part is operating the steering wheel and the controls, the um, the uh, throttles and the gear shift. That's the easy part. The hard part is maneuvering an anchor up at the bow, which, you know, weighs perhaps at least 60 pounds. So we're talking about quite a weight. And um, And whenever we see a guy at the controls and a girl struggling with the anchor at the bow and he's screaming instructions and she's just getting more and more frustrated and upset you know we know that they are beginners and they're either going to learn how to do it or they're not long for this lifestyle Uh, but you know we learn very quickly that uh, in spite of the fact that most of us guys think that we have a, a better ability at and and it's true spatially men tend in general to be better than women uh, and so we tend to think we should do the 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 maneuvering and the controls but it makes no sense it's just so easy for a girl to learn how to maneuver the boat it's so much better for the man to jump onto the dock you know that 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 is fraught with all kinds of physical challenges Uh, such as the boat trying to get away once you're on the dock and holding it with one line. Um, It's so much more sense for a man to handle the anchor and for a woman to control the boat. So, you know, that's what we do. Um, In terms of steering on on a passage, we we pretty much share the time, and we've also got children with us who like doing that as well very often the steering consists of putting the boat onto the autopilot so it steers itself and um, and then keeping a very close watch out to make sure that there's nothing in the way let alone other boat traffic but you've got to watch for things like every now and then you know these huge 40 foot steel containers that you'll find on cargo ships every now and then they fall off and they usually float just about at the surface of the water You've got to really watch out for those, particularly if you're on a shipping lane and there's been a storm recently because these things usually fall off cargo ships during a storm. And then in the Pacific Northwest, which is our boating territory, uh, you want to watch out for logs, huge logs that uh, got loose and can cause damage. So, uh, and we, so we usually split the time on that. Uh, when we're doing any close quarter maneuvers, Susan is at the wheel and I'm outside dealing with anchors or lines or whatever else is going on. But uh, generally speaking, with us as well, the all the food, all the provisioning, <clears throat> deciding what should be bought and where it should be stowed and what meals will be, all of that Susan takes care of. I don't even know anything about it. And likewise, she doesn't uh, worry about whether there's enough um, electricity in the batteries for the evening, and she doesn't worry about whether there's enough propane in the tanks to run the stove. Uh, and if if she feels chilly and she wants to turn on the heater, she is justified to expect that it will work when she turns it on. Uh, and again, by the way, on a boat, a heater isn't a case of just turning on an electric heater. It's usually a lot more complicated. 
Uh, we usually have a heater that burns diesel fuel. So anyway, uh, and we, we, we love the lifestyle. We love spending our vacations in that way. And um, obviously not a lot of people do, but as I say, at any given time, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of couples doing this. Some of them doing it you know, during summer vacation, many of them, hundreds of them doing it as a long-term retirement, post-retirement lifestyle. And you'll find them in the Mediterranean, you'll find them in the Caribbean, you'll find them on the east coast of North America, you'll find them in Mexico. Uh, they're all over the place. And uh, that's what they do. So why are these marriages surprisingly durable in spite of the fact that it's not an easy life? In a certain way, it's a little bit like being a pioneer moving out west in the 1800s in North America, you know, where you're going to be living in a fairly isolated cabin and, um, and you know, there's, there's no doctor around the corner, there's no dentist around the corner, there's no, you really have to take, you know, you're off the grid, you're doing it yourself. Uh, it's a lot like that. And those marriages also tended to endure. So what is it about that kind of, well, I'll tell you. First of all, just by the nature of the reality of things, the jobs break down to blue and pink. It doesn't make sense for my 120-pound wife to be the one responsible for handling a 60-pound lunk of steel called an anchor, manhandling it or woman handling it. It doesn't make sense. Secondly, I am innately fascinated by machinery. I like machinery. And, um, and when something goes wrong, I end up with a pretty good sense of what it is, or I know how to diagnose it, and I know how to troubleshoot. I'm comfortable doing that. Susan is very comfortable not doing that. And on the other hand, she's very comfortable thinking in terms of the food and the nutrition that uh, a crew on the boat needs. So one way or another, she's very happy doing what she does. I'm very happy doing what I do. We split the tasks, and between us, we both keep it all running. But in an ordinary, conventional, modern, 21st century suburban lifestyle, it's a lot harder to say that jobs automatically break down because in many cases, both the husband and the wife spend a day at work in an office, maybe, uh, and then they come home. And who's, who's to say, why, why should it be that the woman is responsible for dinner? Why? Because when you think about it, you know, what what has the guy been doing? Well, he makes sure that the electricity bill gets paid so the gas stove or the electricity stove works. Well, she can do that just as well. There are very few masculine jobs that happen in a modern couple's modern lifestyle. And since, you know, is he fixing the car? Probably not. He calls the car guy, the mechanic. And then they pay that out of the, the household uh, bank account. So she doesn't look at him as taking care of the masculine jobs anymore. Like she could call up the car guy. Uh, the plumbing, you know, the, the plumbing doesn't work properly. They call up the plumber. But there's nothing that he does which is uniquely and specifically masculine. See where I'm going here, guys. You really, really need to be handy around the house. You need to have tools and you need to take responsibility for actually fixing things with your hands. <laughs> but um, that's, that's one distinction. Um, another one is that there is a joint mission that they're on. You get what I'm saying? The mission is to keep the boat running and to be able to successfully have a safe passage from wherever you are now to the next port you're going to 
and uh, to be able to pull that off successfully and safely. All right, so there again, right? You, you are in a shared mission. You're both united and you both realize that you can't do it alone. If for no other reason than if you're on a night passage, you have to take, you have to change shifts. You have to take changes because one person has to grab some sleep while the other person keeps a lookout on the journey on what's going on outside, make sure there's no perils and there's no traffic. And, uh, and so, you know, it, you can't possibly manage without the other person. And you're aware of that all the time. So it's a mission in which you intuitively both realize the contribution, the vital and indispensable contribution that you both make. But in a 21st century modern suburban lifestyle, what's the mission? And where are where is there an indispensable need for one another? You know, a woman a woman can run a household entirely by herself. I'm not saying she wants to, I'm not saying it's fun or delightful, but she could. And to a lesser extent and less capably, a man could do the same. You can bring in, you can ring up for take for takeout food to be delivered, and um, you, uh, uh, you, as I say, when anything needs fixing, you call the man and the uh, you call somebody to do laundry and fix the washing machine, and so there there isn't a point at which you so vitally realize that you need your spouse, you need the other person, because you don't. You see. That is a problem. And so, obviously, because of the many differences between a couple living and traveling around the world on a boat, and by the way, I'm sure there are other examples, but this is just one, obviously, that I'm very familiar with. And it seems to produce very durable and very happy marriages. Um, you know, every couple in this lifestyle that we've ever encountered, they really do seem to to just love one another and to to enjoy being together, which is, again, by the way, something else you might have thought would contribute to a rash of divorces in the lifestyle of small boating. And that is you can't ever actually get away from the other person. There isn't really I mean, other the time other than the time when you're in the head which to landlubbers is the toilet. Um, I mean, when else are you actually, I guess you could go sit on the front of the boat, the pointy part we call the bow, or if the other person is there, you could go to the stern, the blunt end. Um, you know, you could, I guess you could, you know, but it's not like being even, even a small suburban apartment has uh, probably at least twice the square footage of, of, of a boat, at least. What is a, a suburban apartment? Seven, eight hundred feet, nine hundred feet, something like that. I, I, I mean, not going to be much less than that, right? Um, the floor space on a think of a of a roughly a forty foot boat, um, maybe three hundred square feet, and then another three hundred square feet on the deck outside if the weather's okay and the motion is not too uncomfortable. Um, and there you are, you know, you, you're lucky if you've got five, 600 square feet on a boat. Lucky. Very unusual. And I think most people are living in houses or apartments uh, with um, a lot more floor space than that. So there's a lot of reasons you would have thought these marriages wouldn't work. But they do. Because there are blue and pink rolls. And there are... Um, uh, and and we each one sees the indispensability of the other. There is a mission. There's a purpose. There's somewhere you're going, and and it takes both of us to make it possible for us to get there safely. Uh, and um, and uh, those 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 are among the reasons. So, in a regular marriage, then, in, in a marriage of a couple living a conventional 21st century suburban lifestyle, it's a lot more difficult because a lot of these very positive strengthening factors are not there. 
So you kind of got to come up with them. You got to create them artificially or realistically. You got to make them happen. And uh, how do you how do you do that? Well, for one thing, you, for a start, you don't get married without having some really serious conversations. And the conversations do not consist of, I love you. Oh, no, I love you more. No, 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 I love you even more than that. I'm not denigrating love, but marriage is serious. And you've got to have serious conversations. And it continues to astound me how many couples are in a marriage going through challenging times and who acknowledge in response to a question that no, they never had these discussions beforehand. And so just a simple question, what is going to be the mission of our marriage? What is the purpose of our marriage? It's not just physical companionship. It's part of it. But what is the purpose of our marriage? Is the purpose to have children? Is it one of the purposes? And if so, what is going to be special about the children we bring into the world and raise compared to others? How, what are we going to be doing differently? These questions have to be discussed. Now, as you know, uh, I am a very strong proponent of the man taking responsibility for the money and the woman who may or may not also work, but knowing that her income is not income on which the, 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 the couple or the family depends. Uh, that is a huge why, because once again, that highlights blue and pink. And please remember that you cannot refute me by saying, does this strange antiquated rabbi not realize we're in the 21st century? Doesn't he realize things are different today? Doesn't he realize men and women are the same and we're egalitarian and we share roles 100% equally in our marriage because we are a modern equal marriage? Um, lots of luck. If that's you, lots of luck is all I can say to you because uh, you're making your life. Well, I'm not even going to go into it. You, <laughs> It's just a reality. Um, the fact is that part of the joy, part of the value, and part of the pleasure and smooth running of a marriage hinges on male-female polarity. The more she tries to be masculine and the more he becomes feminine, the less likely the marriage is to endure for long at all. Marriages thrive on male-female polarity, on distinctiveness, on masculine-feminine difference. Okay, this is a reality. Uh, nothing of any real accomplishment happy, happens without it, even if you just think of your basic electrical socket. And it's amazing, right? Because it'll that socket will wash your clothes, it'll bring light into your house, it'll probably cook your food. That electrical socket, and by the way, you begin to see why energy is so important and why the stupid games being played by so many governments around the world these days of pretending that all this can be supplied by wind and by solar, by sustainable sources. All of that nonsense is um, is terribly, terribly dangerous because of how much you depend on that socket in the wall with two out with two little slots in it, or that switch above it which turns the flow of electrical current on and off. So much of your life is dependent upon that working smoothly. And um, I've spoken in the past about what happens. One of the very first signs of societal breakdown is the uh, collapse of energy supply. And there are uh, there is a state in the United States that regularly every summer experiences power outages because they have behaved very stupidly in their energy policy. 
But uh, going back to that electrical outlet, you'll notice that unlike, uh, shall we say, a gas pipe, which just has one pipe that supplies the gas, the electrical socket has two pipes culminating in the two little slots. You could think of them as positive and negative. And even though we use alternating current, not direct current, and even though it's a lot more complicated than that, uh, obviously it makes no sense for me to delve into it here and now. But the bottom line is that uh, there is a difference in polarity between those two sockets. And that's why if you were completely suspended in the air, and you put your finger in one of the sockets, nothing would happen to you. It would only be a problem if you put your other finger in the other socket. That's why birds who land on electrical wires are not electrocuted, because they're only on one wire, they're on one conductor. But if the conductors were close enough together for the bird to put one uh, claw onto the one wire and the other onto the other wire, you would have fricasseed pigeon. Um, it would be instantly cooked and incinerated even. So what I'm, why I'm saying that is that the, the power works because there is a difference in polarity. The electrons are propelled to flow from one pole to the other. And on the way, they can be induced to do a whole lot of work for us, like washing our clothing. That's how nice this is. This is how well the system works. So polarity is a wonderful thing. And polarity is found in a man, between a man and a woman. Masculine and feminine are very polarity separate. One of the reasons, that those of you who, who are biblically literate and interested, you will have come across uh, biblical verses that say that men should wear men's clothing and women should wear women's clothing. And again, your first response to that, oh, how stupid that is, how sexist that is, how primitive that is. Uh, men and women can wear the same clothing. And uh, the answer to that is, that just means you do not know the extent to which your psychology and your psyche and your entire being, your emotions, your psychology, all of you, is impacted by what you do with your body, what you physically do. And so uh, if you conduct yourself in a unisexual way, and so does your spouse, you will find a dramatic diminishing of sexual tension between the two of you. It's as simple as that. Um, some of you have probably heard the scrolling through scripture teaching available on our website, where I go through and talk about uh, uh, specific sections of scripture. And uh, one of the things I've explained is that uh, one of the um, one of the interesting things that Adam and Eve do is when they have eaten the apple and they discover that they are naked and they become erotically conscious, the first thing they do is they pull some fig leaves down and they sort of um, arrange them as loincloths to conceal their genitals. That's what they do. Later on, when God evicts them from the Garden of Eden, by the way, you should go and take a look at this. This is interesting. He evicts them from the Garden of Eden, and it says he makes them leather outfits. And it says, not for them, it says for Adam and for Eve. And you would have thought Adam and Eve would have said, oh, don't go to the trouble, Lord. Uh, we're fine. We've got these great green outfits. It's very cool. We've got green threads here. We've got these leaves. We're comfortable. Uh, but no, God says that won't do. I've got to make you clothing out of leather. And in the original Hebrew text, what is very evident, and not perhaps less so in many of the translations, but that's why you need a rabbi. That's me. Uh, what's very interesting is that the, uh, the, the fig leaves that Adam and Eve first crafted into basic loincloths uh, were identical. Male and, he and hers, his and hers were the same. But when God made them leather outfits, he made a completely different one for a man and a completely different one for a woman. Because 
the world runs on male-female polarity, on masculine-feminine polarity. And masculine-feminine polarity is enhanced by dressing in a male way for a man and dressing in a female way for a woman. And um, I don't think there are many men listening who do not feel a surge of joy and excitement when they come home and find that amazingly and astonishingly their wife is dressed in a very feminine way. Yeah, that's right. And um, I said earlier, guys, you should, uh, you should make sure your wife sees you fixing things around the house. Well, again, let me say that I don't think there'd be many women listening who do not feel a surge of joy at watching their man competently wield his tools, solving a problem, fixing something that was broken. Blue and pink, that's it, baby. Don't lose sight of it. It's very, very real. So uh, here's the thing. Let's take a look at the 10 most prevalent reasons that people give for the failure of their marriages. And, and this sort of data is really easy to lay one's hands on because uh, uh, marriage therapists and marriage counselors keep notes and they write articles and they write books. And so um, the, 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 the list of the 10 most commonly cited reasons for the demise of a marriage that I'm going to give you absolutely standard. It's not going to differ substantially from many, many other lists that you can find around. They're, they all say the same 10 things in in various uh, different ways. But but here they are. I'm going to gonna go through them one. Well, I'll go through them all together and then I'll go back on them. Um, uh, I chose the wrong person or I married the wrong person. Number two, we fell out of love. Number three, we stopped communicating. Number four, we grew apart. Number five, we married too young. Number six, we just spend more time arguing than doing anything else. Number seven, he or she subjected me to mental, emotional, verbal abuse. Take your pick. Number eight, we just no longer share the same values. Number nine, we've 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 kind of got different goals we we we're we're looking for different things number 10 we fight about money okay those those are the 10 most common reasons given for why people uh divorce okay so before i go into it i want to tell you one fundamental fact about divorce and um and there are so many of you who are going to write in and say, yes, I know you're telling the truth, because in the years of counseling that uh, Susan and I have done, I can't tell you how many times uh, people, we actually, I could point out gifts in our home that were given to us by couples who followed this advice. That's, that's how common it is. What I'm going to tell you is that almost without exception, overwhelmingly, and I can safely say you, you, and you, this is true for virtually everybody. If instead of proceeding along the lines of a divorce, you decide, no, we're sticking with this marriage, however unpleasant it is, however much abuse there is, however much no communicating, however much we're not breaking up. If you do that, in an amazingly short period of time down the road, measured in months, not years, you will be grateful and happy. That's right. Why is that? Well, I, I told you before that a lot of people don't realize the extent to which we are shaped by the actions we take and by the behavior we do. Over here, the behavior of deciding to stick with a marriage has a profound impact. A profound impact. And... Uh, and you go through a rough patch, and after that, everything is great. It really is. Now, in the case of infidelity, 
you'll notice I didn't include that in the 10 because I'm talking about the 10 most common for which there is an answer. Infidelity is a little bit more complicated. I will tell you this, that if the woman has betrayed the marriage, um, forget about it. It's over. Just move on. Do your best. If the man has betrayed the marriage, it is possibly salvageable. It's not easy or simple. It's not pain-free, but it is possible. Okay, so I'm leaving infidelity out of this because it's in a category of its own. But in the ordinary cases, these 10 examples, if people decide to just stick, they sit down one day and they say, you know what? Uh, yes, we grew apart. Yes, we have different values. Yes, this, yes, that, yes, the other, but we're not separating. It's not going to happen. We're going to make this work. As painful as it is, we're going to make it work. You will be grateful that you did in the overwhelming majority of cases. You've got to be aware that there's a whole divorce industry out there that is doing everything possible to encourage you. And um, I, also, I also recommend that married couples do not hang out with divorced people. Sorry for you divorced folks. I, uh, I do understand that you also deserve love. But um, uh, find it among single people because it's not good and healthy for married couples to hang out socially with divorced people. Just not. Again, the way you behave, the way you conduct yourself, the actions you take have a colossal impact on your spiritual reality, on your mental reality, on your emotional reality. So, um, we um, look, you know, I just, I'm getting divorced. I just chose the wrong person. I ended up marrying the wrong person. All right, well, uh, let me explain the truth of this. The truth is, and I, I, I will tell you that um, there's a couple that we know who was one of the couples who were mass married under the Church of the Unification. You might remember that Korean organization that existed for a while. Maybe it still does. It was uh, led by the late Reverend Sun Mung Moon, and he uh, used to, from time to time, do mass marriages where he, he would literally say, you and you, you get married, you stand there, you and you, you and you, and he'd take a hundred men and a hundred women and pair them off and say, you are now going to be married, and he would marry them. And what shocked the secular world of, um, of, of um, American psychology was that uh, these marriages all did so well. You know, there were, there were the, the same statistics or, or, or as you might find in other groups. But by and large, uh, the majority of these marriages did just fine. Everyone very happy. Isn't that weird? Do you think the Reverend Moon had psychic powers that could allow him to pick strangers just knowing that they would click and they'd fall in love and that they would, they're just the right couple men for each other? I'm going to tell you something which if you've been raised on Hollywood romantic comedies and if you've been raised on Walt Disney old style before the company went woke and broke, uh, you will be shocked and outraged. You will be indignant. Uh, you, you, you're going to want to slap me or punch me, but I'm going to tell it to you anyways. And, um, and that is that barring um, ill health, barring outright unhygienic sheer ugliness, but barring those exceptional cases, you take a perfectly normal 24-year-old man and you take a perfectly normal 20-year-old woman. And when I say normal, I mean, you know, who have not been damaged by the culture and by wokeism and by modernity and by secularism and by liberalism. When I say normal, I mean normal. I don't mean average. I don't mean common. I mean normal, people who are normal human beings. Presuming you could find somebody like that, but if you took a perfectly normal, healthy, 
24-year-old guy, the, the, the sort of guy you might meet at the Wichita County Fair, um, you know, and you, you took a perfectly normal 19 or 20-year-old woman, the sort of woman who might be doing um, Grange or 4-H at the Wichita, Wichita State Fair or the Kansas State Fair, and uh, you uh, tell the guy, put a ring on her finger and come with me to the local synagogue or the local church. We're going to get you two married and you can start off your life and uh, start living. The overwhelming odds are it would be just fine, provided they trusted you and provided they were able to make the commitment. But if they did, even the fact that they didn't know each other and they don't share interests and they don't like the same movies and they haven't even spoke to one another to figure out whether they share the same political views, it doesn't matter. A marriage can work between almost any man and any woman. You know, age matching, appearance matching, and so on, given, you know, not, uh, I'm not, I'm not being preposterous here. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, a 50-year-old person and a 20-year-old person put them together and they can marry. No, it's not how it works. But <clears throat> if uh, basically when a man tells me I'm not married yet because I haven't found the right woman, um, I have to stop myself from bursting out into laughter of derision and ridicule. I mean, really, you haven't found the right... No, you're not married yet because you haven't become the right man, period. That's it. That's all. You could literally go up to the next woman you meet on the street who is attractive and, and who appears normal, and you could go ahead and marry her. You'll be better off than you are now. And the odds are it'll become a lovely marriage. And that's male-female polarity and the idea of male-female commitment, and away you go. It works. It really, really works. Susan and I have a lot of friends among Mennonite and Amish communities around the country, and so we know a lot of families. And um, and you, you can ask them, you know, how, how, how did you meet? How did you get married? Well, you know, we, uh, he, you know, he... He um, saw me in church. He asked his father about me. His father spoke to my father. Uh, we uh, we met and we got married. And um, and that was yes, it works. Why? Because there are blue and pink roles. There is a mission to the marriage. And there is a commitment that is unbreakable. There you go. It works. And they're happy, really happy. And you've got to look at the children that they've conceived and given birth to and brought into the world. And and you realize only happy parents produce ch children like that. They're lovely children. It's a very important point, by the way, what I just said. Happy parents produce great kids. Happily married parents produce great kids. Happily married parents produce great kids. So uh, so when it comes to choose and marry the wrong person, we reject that as an excuse right away. You didn't. The very fact that you've managed to live together for X number of months or years already shows that you're not the wrong person. You are both turning each other and yourselves into the wrong person. But if you stop doing that, and start making sure that you repair the damage, you're going to be great. You'll be happy and grateful that you saw it through. We fell out of love. Well, the term falling in love is all you need to know, because we shouldn't be falling in this world. We should be rising. If somebody told me, you know, I'm marrying her because we rose in love, I'd burst into joyful laughter, and I'd say, go for it. I'll be happy to dance at your wedding. Uh, because that would be a very refreshing change. Falling, you're not supposed to fall into anything. 
Falling is a really bad, any sentence that begins, I fell, is not a good thing. So uh, we fell out of love. Well, you obviously decided to get married on the basis of falling in love, which was really one of the very silly things you did. But now that you're there, I refer you back to point number one and make it work. Now, again, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to sound uh, um, simplistic about this. Uh, in real life, this is many, many, many hours of counseling, many hours of working through these things in order to make a marriage work. So, um, you know, so it's not, it's not as if a couple comes to my study and say, we, we're at the end of our tether, uh, we're about to decide on getting divorced, and I say, oh, simple, just decide to commit, and away you go, you'll be fine. No, it doesn't work like that. It's hard, hard work, and it takes a long time. But, uh, but I'm giving you the high points, I'm giving you the themes that make it work. Uh, we stopped communicating. Yeah, I, I don't dispute that. Um, there, there are many times uh, in, in our marriage where one of us will say to the other, have said, to the other, you know what, we need some more time. to. We, ha we haven't spent enough time talking. We're, be we're both getting caught up in work. We're getting caught up in one thing or another. We need, yeah, of course you have to communicate. And you may even need some help. Um, you know, maybe a relative or a wise mentor, but you may need somebody to help teach you again how to communicate. But the fact that you've stopped communicating is not a reason to get divorced. It's a reason to learn how to communicate. It's not too late. Number four, we grew apart. That one, I don't even know what that means. What did we grew apart mean? Okay, it in very often, and I didn't make this a category of its own because it sort of shows up implicitly in all of these categories, and that is our our physical connection is uh, subpar, right? Our our intimate life is not what it what it should be. Yeah, yeah, that that certainly is is also is is absolutely a problem, but it's usually not the reason for couples wanting to divorce. It's usually part of the reason. And uh, we grew apart. Yeah, it would lack of intimacy would be a part of that as well, no question about it. And um, and that is something that uh, has to be has to be repaired, has to be dealt with. I mean, obviously it is. Again, it's it's one of the the most incandescent moments of masculine feminine polarity is when the husband and wife are, are intimate. That is it. That is the high point of masculine-feminine polarity. So, of course, you want to exercise it. And, of course, you want it to be a, an active part of a uh, successfully functioning marriage. Right? Goes without saying. Um, so, yeah, that we grew apart is not, is not a, a reason. So uh, fix up some of these other things and you'll start growing together again. And by the way, once you know you're yoked to one another, once you know you are handcuffed to one another, um, you'll figure out that growing apart is not so much fun. You'll, you'll have more fun growing together. Uh, we married too young. That's number five. Right? We just married too young. Um, I can assure you that there are more problems associated with marrying too old than with too young. So you think, well, yeah, he's right. Yeah, too old is no good. Too young is no good. Just right is right. Problem is, nobody knows what just right is. And so uh, younger is better than older. And um, I will tell you one of the things that is very much a real problem and and um, it's, it's, it's difficult to deal with. I want to tell you, I've spoken about this in the past, but the more prior, um, the more prior physical experience that the spouses experienced with other people before they got married, 
the more difficult it is to make a marriage function. And it is many times more serious. And again, you know, throw brickbats at me. You're not going to like this uh, because we live in modern egalitarian times of equality and there's no difference between men and women. But uh, sadly, there is and joyfully there is. And uh, yes, I will tell you. And again, the data on this is in, by the way. If you don't like what I'm saying, I'm only the messenger. Don't shoot me. Um, This is just reality it's it's out there it's well known it's uh it's it's there's no argument about this and that is that uh the more prior relationships the woman had before marriage the harder it is for her to be and enjoy a a durable long-term stable secure marriage Sorry about it. That's just the reality, folks. It's it's just a reality. I can talk much more. I can do a whole show on why that is and what's going on and uh, and and uh, uh, how that happens. But it just does. You should know it. Um, the most uh, successful, the most durable. The it's easiest to build a happy, durable marriage when uh, each is the, uh, the other's first partner of life experience. Uh, it's that's a reality. And so if you are raising your children in a certain way that will make it likely that they will be their future spouse's uh, first partner, you'd be doing a wise thing. According to the statistics, it's just the reality. So no, we married too young, not a reason for it. You might have married immature. You might have married without having crucial substantive conversations. That all of that is true, but nothing to do with your age. I mean, what did you get married when you were 14? But when people tell me they get married too young, I always ask them how old they were they, when they got married, and they always hesitate for a moment. And I know what the hesitation means. They don't realize that everyone who lies doesn't realize you hesitate before you lie. And so you don't realize that people can tell. But I say, so, so how old were you both when you got married? And there's usually this little hesitation. I know they're trying to figure out whether they should lie or tell the truth because the answer is always 27, 32, 26. Yeah, really? Too young? And they know. They know that it's a stupid reason. Number six, we just spend more time arguing than anything else. Well, that's one. that one is a little bit like we grew apart. You know, we, we, we're just spending a lot of time arguing with each Yeah, I get it. So... Obviously, there are underlying issues, and um, we are going to now work on how you talk to one another, right? Things do not, you have to, you can disagree, but not everything has to be an argument. And so we're going to show you how to talk to each other. We're going to improve your communication. And you're both going to commit to communicating because you're committed to staying together. And it's a lot more fun living with somebody with whom you communicate easily and fluidly and naturally than with somebody you don't. Um, Number seven, he or she subjected me to mental or emotional or verbal abuse all the time. That's all I get is emotional abuse. So um, on this one, as many of you who who have heard me for a while know that uh, I don't accept that. I just do not accept it, okay? And all of you people are going to cry and whine to me, well, you've never had abuse. I've had to live with mental abuse. Grow up. Just grow up and can it. Um, If you can only be abused by somebody else if you allow it to happen. That's all. And so, again, this just goes back to communication. As long as we're not talking about physical abuse, We're talking about emotional, mental, uh, verbal abuse. All that means is you argue and you don't know how to communicate and you're growing apart. That's all that means. But this word of abuse has become a trigger word. So uh, it doesn't impress me one little bit. Uh, I I dismiss it and I say I need specifics. You can can see why. (laughs) You can see why not a lot of people... Uh, want me to walk them through um, a marriage problem. Uh, I'm not the soft, touchy-feely kind on this. I'm sorry. I'm results-oriented, 
and I want you to hear these things very, very clearly. You want to tell me about, oh, your mental abuse that you suffered? Fine. I want to know exactly what that entails. What does it mean? They woke you up with a noisy alarm clock or they, uh, what does it mean? I, I need to hear exactly what it means. Don't use the word abuse. Tell me what it was. And uh, whenever this happens, it always falls away. Always just falls away. And it become. but you've got to get rid of this nonsense of this term abuse. It's become so popular. Just thoroughly destructive. Number eight. We no longer share values. Did you ever? Did you actually have a meeting, a serious conversation before you got engaged? Did you have a serious meeting to talk about what your mission was? What are your goals? And I'm not talking about John's goals and Janet's goals. I'm talking about the goal of the marriage. That's what it has to be. Marriage is not about furthering your uh, your stamp collection or your you know whatever whatever your own go your your career goals you know i'm forget it you no longer share your goals yeah okay so i mean oh value values and goals these are two number eight is we no longer share values well that the values that set the boundaries of a marriage are hugely important did you ever decide what the values are they have to be set did you ever say what the inviolable moral boundaries of the marriage are what are the true values and so to now say we no longer share values, all that means is you probably never had them and uh, it means that now is a really good time to start figuring out what the marriage the values of this marriage are same for goals we had different goals well yeah you know a man and a woman generally have different goals in many many different areas but there was a goal to make a marriage to make a loving committed durable marriage wasn't that a goal well how can you have a different i mean you're sitting here you must have that is the goal surely what's different we're not here to talk about you know your goals of filling your bucket list you want to uh, ride a um, a one of those uh, wire lines what are they called? i forget the word uh, you want to go to thailand to uh, to ride an elephant I mean, fine you know figure it out you, you, that's not what we're talking about here those are, are have nothing to do with the viability of the marriage and then finally number 10 money and budget disagreements huge one really really important did you talk about it like is it something you plan so has there now been a departure from an original agreed upon um i'll tell you what what shows up very very often and i i counsel a lot of marriage counselors so um when i say i've seen something many many times you probably think to yourself, well how many couples could he have seen uh the answer is dozens and dozens hundreds because I'm one step removed and I will have a counselor sit down and talk with me in great detail about a marriage that they're grappling with trying to help and, and salvage. So um, uh, budget and, and, and money, disagreement, yeah, that, that is, is really serious and uh, that does have to be worked on. Obviously, if we have made money more of a blue job than a pink job then that's a big help it's a big help now even then there can be monetary problems i don't know if you've seen the uh, ask the rabbi that we just published on our website but this was a man who wrote in to tell us that he just discovered we won't go into how he discovered but he discovered from some mail that his wife received that uh, she had inherited a large sum of money a while earlier from a, a departed relative, and he's terribly upset because she never told him about it. So here's a couple with a, a money argument, excepting she doesn't know that he knows, and she doesn't know that he's beside himself with unhappiness at the fact that she got a huge sum of money 
compared to their budget and compared to some of the challenges they face. And she never told him. And we answered it in a way that uh, he was truly shocked. It was like he got hit by a baseball bat. He was so shocked at what we told him. And uh, you can see that on the website at rabbidaniellappin.com. Um, it is the uh, Ask the Rabbi. And so, uh, yeah, all of these things, all of them could be resolved. Not a single one of them is a reason to end a marriage. And uh, they are all things that if you commit to getting past them, you will get past them and you will be very grateful and you will be happy. Uh, please don't for a moment think that the uh, the life, well, you know, you don't need me to tell you what the life of divorced people is like. Uh, you don't need me to tell you how the children of divorce feel. All of this is pretty well known, and uh, I know you all know it. So there it is. Uh, we focus on our family and our faith, our finance, our friendships, and our fitness. And today, uh, we were talking mostly about family. But of course, all of these things interact with one another. And um, if you want to have a beautifully fulfilling marriage, then you need to know a whole lot about finances as well. And if you want to know about uh, finances and succeed in finances, well, you actually need to work on friendships too. And all of these five areas uh, collaborate with one another and interact with one another and collude with one another to both help or harm each other. So there it is, my dear happy warriors. I visualize each and every one of you in a happy and wonderful marriage. If you are a man with a beautiful feminine woman, and if you are a woman with a fantastic, wonderful masculine man, and uh, remember, all of these things can be improved, every one of them. You can become much more feminine if you're a lady. <laughs> you can if you're a guy as well, but don't. Uh, you can become much more feminine if you're a girl, and you can become much more masculine if you're a guy. And uh, there are ways to do this. Read the holistic you if you don't know, but you can figure it out for yourself because I've already told you. Act masculine and you'll start being more masculine. Act feminine, you'll start being more feminine. And feeling it as well. Act more masculine, you'll feel more masculine. Act feminine, you'll start feeling more feminine. The power of action to shape our beings is incalculable. Please, please do not underestimate it. So until next week, I remain honored to be your rabbi. And you stay true to improving your family, your finances, your faith, your fitness, and your friendships. God bless.